Hey everybody, welcome to OT with just DA this time. Welcome to Instagram, hello to YouTube. Great to see people signing on already. Hello Rich, hello Ryan, hello Patrice. Hello SYGLV19, hello L Davis1844, hello Avery Botticelli, hello Mikaushala, a bunch that I missed. Terrible Terry Golden Girl says, hi from Ohio. Thank you again for your beautiful paintings. Such a sweet thing to do. Hello, Judy. Hello, Sierra Hiker. Hello, Sherry. Hello, Sharon. Hello, Debbie. Hello, Aixa62. Hello, Edward. Hello, Ronto. Hello, Larky. Well, that's a neat, neat name, Larky. Hello, Dino. Hello, Gregory. Hello, Stefan. Stefan, I love your enthusiasm, man. You don't do anything without at least half a dozen exclamation points, which I really like. Move that microphone over a little bit. Uh, let's see, who else do we got? Hello, L. Davis. Whoa, somebody says hello from Bolivia. Who was that? Chispita79 says hello from Bolivia. Well, hello from Bolivia. Stefan says, how was your day? I had an amazing day. Hello, Gunny. Hello, Dashy Dash 707. I had an extremely productive day, which I really love those kinds of days. Hey, Greg says, cheers, mate. Happy Sabbath. I will be with you next Sabbath, Greg, in Australia. Can't wait. Hello, Bernie. Hello, Deb. Hope you're feeling better, Deb. Hello, Ruben. Hello, Byzantium 77. Hello, Arlene. Hello, Kiki 103. Hello, Will from Ireland. Whoa, my guy. Coming to us from Ireland. Hello, Lupe. Hello, Wits Messi. Darla, Flory, Gerald. He says it's a beautiful full moon day. All right. Hello, Susanna. Hello, KB Photog. Kirsten Rez says hi from Idaho. Happy Sabbath. A happy Sabbath to you in Idaho. Deb says she's feeling a little better, not 100%, but better. Hello, Holly. Hello, Dita 07070. Hello, Jamie. Tennessee Quiltbug. Tennessee Quiltbug says, good evening, Pastor DA. Well, good evening to you, Tennessee Quiltbug. Hello, Mrs. V. Carter. Hello, Nilno Gueras. Hello, Aaron. Happy Sabbath, he says, from... Hosur, India. Wow. Aaron double, let's see, what is it? Aaron O double eight. Awesome. And then closer to home, happy Sabbath from Spokane. Prima or Prim Martinelli. Did I get that right? From Brazil. Woo, man, we're going global. All right, everybody. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Hello, crazy scriptures. Will Pat too says, when are you coming to Ireland? Brother, I would love to go to Ireland. It's a country I've never been to. All I need is an invitation. Crazy Scripture says, happy Sabbath from Tampa Bay. Well, I know where that is. I've been there. All right, everybody, welcome. I've got a few announcements to make. I have not been making very many announcements. As you know, when we start off with these With DA reading challenges in the beginning, Oh, probably the first 10 or 15 or maybe more presentations. I have lots of announcements to make, usually about shirts and ordering the Conflict Beautiful and many other things. And then I kind of stop with the announcements, largely stop with the announcements. But now tonight, I actually have a few and they're important. So if you're tuning in on Instagram, please pay attention to the announcements. And if you're listening on YouTube also, first of all, I just want to quickly say one of my announcements is YouTube, I'm so sorry. I don't know why this happened, but two of the videos are out of order on my YouTube channel. Now, they're, they're out of order in the actual videos. They uploaded out of order, which doesn't make any sense because they actually were not uploaded out of order, but YouTube has put them out of order and I don't know how to put them back in order. But the good news is, is that they are still in the correct order on the playlist. So it's just two chapters that were reversed I could look over and see what they are, but basically they're the last two. And I don't, I don't know why they got inverted like that. I've done everything exactly the way I normally do it, but for some reason, these two have inverted and I apologize for that. The only, I don't think there's an easy solution. So if there is an easy solution, let me know in the comments 
and then I will switch it around because it's actually driving me a little bit crazy that they're that they're out of order. Fortunately, again, not out of order on the playlist, but they are out of order in the actual videos. Okay, that's announcement number one. Announcement number two, this is very important. Tomorrow, Saturday, we will be doing a double header, but not like we normally do a double header where I sit down and we're, like we're gonna do tonight. Tonight, we're gonna do chapters 56 and 57 back to back. Um, tomorrow, I'm gonna do two sessions Chapters, let's see, I guess it would be 58 and 59. Is that right? Let me just double check this. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to do chapters 58 and 59, but they will be at different times. So if you're tuning in live and you're not able to make uh, one or both of the times, no problem. The videos will be uploaded to YouTube, but tomorrow I'm going to do the first session kind of as a right after church session. I'll probably do it around one or two mountain time, okay? So one or two p.m., so in the middle of the afternoon tomorrow, mountain time, we're gonna do chapter 58, okay? Then tomorrow evening at 7.30, I'm going to do chapter 59, and we'll have a guest, a special guest. And I feel like I'm actually saying some of this wrong. So let me just double check here. Let me check my calendar. Give me one second. Let me make sure that I've got this right because are we really that close to the end? I'm, I'm second guessing myself here. Give me one moment. I probably should have written this down in the notes. Yes, yes, this is correct. So tomorrow we will have a double header, but again, it'll be two separate sessions. One in the afternoon, sometime around two. It'll just kind of depend how early I get up and my preparations and church and all of that. And then we will have an evening session tomorrow at this same time as well. So if you, if you can't make the morning meeting, or I shouldn't say morning, the afternoon meeting, that's okay because it'll be on my YouTube channel, but hopefully you can make both of them. So one at around two mountain time and one at the same time as right now, 7.30. That's my second announcement. Okay. Then on Sunday night, we will not have an OT. Um, I've got something scheduled that night and I, I can't do one on Sunday night. That's why I have to do a double tomorrow. And apologies for that. I think that that's the first time. No, we did do a supplemental session when Elise was here, kind of right in the middle of, of the day, Saturday. But but tomorrow, uh, we will have two sessions, one at two, one at seven, then Sunday, no session. Okay? Sunday, no session. And then back Monday night. Is that right? Yeah, Monday night for the last chapter. That's it. The last chapter, Monday night, chapter 60, but that's not our last session, our last session will be Tuesday night. And that's where we'll do the drawing, we'll do a review, we'll just interact, we'll talk, we'll chat, it'll be great. Now, speaking of the drawing, that's my third announcement. This is very important. I normally give a week uh, of, of preparation, but I, I honestly just forgot. Actually, to be totally honest, it snuck up on me. I, I can't believe how quickly this has all gone by. And I sat down and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm running out of time. So if you would like to be enrolled in the drawing, we're gonna do this just exactly like we did the SC with DA drawing. And this is how it works. First of all, we'll be giving away two sets of the Conflict Beautiful, one in the grayscale and one in the sanctuary, sanctuary color. We'll also be giving away two sets of the Light and Life collection, which is the, uh, let's see, Steps to Christ, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing and Christ Object Lessons. And we'll probably give away a set or two of the journals. So we're going to be giving away a number of things. Sounds like about six things. And uh, I, I might even, I might have a, a special additional gift uh, that we've never given away before, but I'll have to see if I can pull that together. Now, here's how you enroll. If you would like to be enrolled in the drawing, then what you're going to do is you're going to send an email to me. Okay? And that's just david at lightbearers.org. And you've only got a couple days to do this, okay? So, because we're gonna do the drawing on Tuesday and today's Friday night. So you've got Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I'll remind you, okay? So you got three days to send me an email and all it has to say, now this is very important, it just has to say drawing, that's the subject line, drawing or OT with DA drawing. Actually, actually, let's make this easier. They should all say the same thing. Make them all say OT with DA drawing, okay? 
OT with DA drawing, put that in the subject line, send me an email, david at lightbearers.org. That's L-I-G-H-T, lightbearers, B-E-R, oh, now I'm on the spot, B-E-A-R-E-R-S.org. Lightbearers, I'll put it in the description, david at lightbearers.org. And you're gonna send an email that says OT with DA drawing. Then in the um, body of the email, you need to let me know if you're a first time reader through Prophets and Kings or if you've read it through many times before. Because we'll do one set of drawings for first time readers and then another set of drawings for people that have you know been through one, two, three, four, five times before. Okay, so that's the way we typically do it. Also, if you want to include, uh, which often happens, a testimony, a praise, um, a prayer request, a story, and you're welcome to send me an email. I'll be happy to read through them. Or you don't have to. You don't have to put anything personal in there if you don't want to, if you're pressed for time. Again, I apologize. I normally give like a week, but I it, the time just got away from me. So this is only if you want to be enrolled in the drawing. And uh, david at lightbearers.org will do the drawing on Tuesday night. Okay, Tuesday night's the big night. So if I don't have your... If I don't have your email by then, then you're not you're not going to be enrolled in the drawing. And then Wednesday, I fly to Australia, and I can't believe it, but we will have accomplished this, like literally in a in a nick of time, as they say, by the skin of our teeth. Okay, so that's all three announcements. That those are all three announcements. I think I, I might have another one that'll come to my mind, but hopefully that's all clear. And um, we're going to get started tonight. We're we're doing two chapters tonight. As I've already said, chapters 56 and 57, and these two chapters will bring us to the end of the sixth section of the book. Remember, the book is divided up into seven sections. Let's just remind ourselves of those sections. Section one, from strength to weakness. Section two, prophets of the northern kingdom. Section three, a preacher of righteousness. Uh, Section four, national retribution. Again, we've been through all this. Section five, in the lands of the heathen. Section six, after the exile. And there's only two chapters left in section six. Instructed in the law of God, which we're going to cover momentarily. And then Reformation, which we'll cover immediately after that, tonight. Then tomorrow, that means we only have three chapters left. 58, 59, and 60. And again, tomorrow we'll do 58 in the afternoon, 59 in the evening, and then 60 on Monday and then the drawing on Tuesday. So we're done. I mean, we're, we're not totally done, but we're close, like very, very close. And I know that some of you don't maybe love the double chapter sessions, to be totally honest. I don't love them either, typically. But honestly, many of the doubles that we've done in OT with DA Part 2, the chapters have fit together so nicely, and the chapters have been quite short, uh, many of them, that it's actually not been a problem. In fact, tonight, for example, the first of our two chapters, Instructed in the Law of God, chapter 56, quite short. Um, But the only way, the reason that we've had to do these doubles is that between my son's wedding and the uh, holiday season and the trip to Norway and the uh, Loma Linda speaking appointment and Australia, I mean, it's really, miracle would be too strong of a word, but it's a near miracle that we were able to pull this off. And I'm just so happy that it's actually worked out. I created a schedule, and I've actually stuck to it. I, I'm 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 thrilled that it has worked out. And a giant shout out to everybody that's come and, and visited, to the Nathans, to Elise, to Jennifer, to Luke, and I know I'm forgetting somebody in there. Um, it's been awesome to have them come. And a big thank you to Jennifer, who was just with us for the last three days. I love Jennifer so much. I believe in her and her ministry so much. She just sent me the, the nicest text tonight, and I just... I've known her for 25 years, and she's just such a special, dear person. I love her insights. I love her passion. I love her ability to articulate sometimes complicated ideas. Uh, This morning, we had an amazing, in-depth, vigorous, theological conversation on the couch just outside of my office, and I just have so much love and appreciation for her and for all of the people that have come on as guests But it was a real delight to have Jennifer here and then before that, Nathan. And Jennifer was a real champ. I told her, Jen, look, we're going to have to do doubles every day you're here in in order for me to finish on time. And she's such a trooper. She's such a hard worker. She's like, yeah, let's do it. 
anything I can do to help. So it was so great having her here for six chapters. And tonight, flying alone, tomorrow afternoon, we'll also be alone. But then in our last, at least one, at least tomorrow evening, and then maybe Monday evening as well, we'll have a guest, special guest. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that. Okay, that's all of the announcements. Um, does anybody have any questions? Let's see. Very quickly, let me just see. There's a little bit of a lag. Uh, has David said when or what the next DA reading project will be? The answer is not yet. That is to be announced. It's possible that we'll do Acts of the Apostles next, but I might not have enough time to do that this year. And if so, then we'll do one of the shorter books, either Christ Object Lessons or Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Let's see, any other questions about any of the announcements that I made? AXA62 says, it's been a wonderful, blessed experience. God worked it all out and I've grown from the OT with DA experience. Sad this is ending, but look forward to the next reading challenge. Be blessed. Okay. Um, Ryan's asking about the next challenge. Okay, I just answered that. D Dashy Dash says she's already starting to have withdrawals. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Wits Messy says, can't wait for the next reading challenge. Uh, Jacqueline asks, is the next special guest Stefan? No, but it would be great if he was. Um, when can we send the email? You can send the email right now, 68 Greenbug. The email address again is david at lightbearers.org. David at lightbearers.org. Um, Tori says that Jennifer blessed me with the supplemental session. Yes, 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 yes. Is the subject of the email one word or two? OT with DA drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Just like that, Avery. OT with DA, run that all together and then drawing. And, uh, that way when they come in, I can easily separate them away from my other emails. Send that to david at lightbearers.org. Um, the boundaries is posted. TB Davis 4110 says, says, I just want the boundaries talk to be posted. It's posted. It is posted right now. In fact, it's already got, um, let me see how many views it's got already. It's already got 400 views. So it's up and people are loving it. It has a almost a 100% approval rating. So again, if you ever watch any of these videos, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, I know I forget to say this. Here's another announcement. Please like and subscribe, like all the videos, because I like all of the videos to have as close as possible to a 100% um, uh, like ratio. It's not always 100%. In fact, I get a little deflated when it gets below about 98%. But they're all above like 95%, but I love it when they're all, I mean, most of them, to be totally honest, are like 100%. Um, and when one goes below 100%, I'm always like, why? What, what, what was wrong with that one? But anyway, <laughs> I'm being silly and, and a little um, vulnerable with you here. But I do love the fact that you love them and I create them, obviously, to be a blessing to people and um, just for people to grow and to be blessed by. But the supplemental session is already up and you can go watch it right now. Okay. Terrible Terry says, I've seen it twice. Oh, well, you're such a sweetheart. This has been a beautiful blessing, just as they all have been. Thank you and God bless. Oh, yes. And one more announcement. I'll be putting a post up on my um, on my Instagram in the next few days. But, but Ty Gibson and I will be leading a tour in Greece in October of this year. It's going to be an In the Footsteps of the Apostles tour. And we're going to do two tours if necessary. This is exactly what we did in Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. And the first tour filled up very quickly. And so we added a second tour. Um, already, I'm told by the tour organizer, Johnny, that the first tour is basically filled. I think there's like five or 10 spots left, left on the first tour. So the first tour is filled, um, but we're going to add a second tour if we can get at least one bus full, which I think is 59 people. So we we do two buses, Ty's in a bus and I'm in a bus, and then we switch back and forth as we go to these amazing locations. And of course, in Greece, we will go to many of the most important and significant locations described in the book of Acts and in the epistles of the New Testament. And then uh, for those that want to go on the extension, we're also going to go to the island of Patmos, which is, of course, where John received the revelation. That's one of the reasons 
that I'm seriously trying to figure out if I can do Acts of the Apostles later this year, probably in late summer. So like July, August, September, something like that. I don't know if I can pull it off, but I'm going to try. There's only 58 chapters in Acts of the Apostles. And if we could pull it off, it would be amazing because then these ideas and these places would be fresh in the minds of those that are with DA participants that are going to go on the tour. So for those of you that are asking, and I can see some people are asking, hey, I want more information about the tour. Um, I, I'll be putting a post up this um, later this week, but you can go to, I think it's ppvida.org, ppvida.org. And um, you can learn more about the trip. And again, it's uh, we're only going to add the second tour. If we don't get the second bus filled up, which I strongly suspect we will, uh, if we can get at least one bus filled for that second tour, then we'll do another tour. If we don't, then we'll just do the single tour. But I, I'm i about 90% sure, maybe 95% sure that we'll do a second tour. And we would love to have you come. That's an announcement that I need to, I need to be saying more about that. Okay, I think that's enough announcements. Let's get into this. Chapter 57. And apologies for those of you that, that hate announcements. I guess it's chapter 56. Um, I'm not a big announcement guy either, but to be honest, we haven't had many announcements lately, so I'm, I'm willing to be forgiven. <laughs> I'm sure you can understand. Also, don't you like my green, green, <laughs> pink? Don't you like my pink shirt? Light Bears logo on there right here. A big thank you to Jeremy, my friend out of Nashville, Tennessee, who sends me these amazing, what is it? Travis Matthew, I think is the brand fancy brand and uh, puts light bears on them. I got a blue one and a pink one and then a really nice vest. So thank you, Jeremy. Love you, brother. And um, all right, let's do this. Let's do this. Chapter Heathen Plus. We've already done that one. Chapter 56. We're going to race through these a little bit. Fortunately for us, the chapters are kind of short and um, the there's a, there's re they're really simple. Actually, both of these chapters, very simple but very encouraging, especially the second one, especially chapter 57. I absolutely loved it. I love both chapters. So let's have a quick prayer. Father in heaven, bless us now as we open uh, your word and as we think about these uh, final events in the book of Nehemiah. Today we're in what? Chapters, uh, Nehemiah chapters 8, 9, 10, and then 13. So Father, please give us insight, give us understanding, bless us. And as we open scripture, may you open us by your spirit. Teach us things, Lord, in the rubric, in the selection of our word, in the reading through the chapter. And Lord, we're so close to the end of this book. We're learning and we have learned what, you, what you've wanted us to learn. Uh, but Father, we still have what I think is the very best section, which is that seventh section, light at eventide. Uh, but Father, still, we've got to finish up chapter or section six. So bless us now as we go through these two chapters is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Sorry about all the announcements. Okay. Let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in chapter 56 instructed in the law of God. This chapter is based on Nehemiah chapters eight, nine, and 10, which again, I hope you read along with the various chapters that are um, being explicated in our book, Prophets and Kings, it helps immensely. And it really helps you to get a feel for the shape of the text and how it is that Ellen White unpacks and um, further explains many of these things that often, not always, but often, uh, they're kind of skeletal in their description, kind of bare bones in their description. And one of the great things about the conflict beautiful is that is that we begin to put layers and, and meat and sinew and muscle and skin onto this skeleton, and it just makes the passage and the story of Scripture and the narrative and God's covenantal faithfulness come alive in a way that it might not otherwise. Um, not to say that Scripture is insufficient. Scripture is entirely sufficient within itself, but this is one of the reasons that we love reading books about Scripture. Of course, the only words that are inspired are scripture, right, in, in the canonical sense, but we can read commentaries and we can read what others say. We can listen to With DA. We can read from what I regard as inspired sources. 
and and what we what we come away with is just a more fleshed out, a fuller understanding of these incredible stories. And this chapter is no exception. Okay, so so the wall is being rebuilt, and in fact, when we get here to this chapter, the wall is largely rebuilt, but the city is still in ruins. Um, the temple is rebuilt, but there's, there's a lot of work still to do, and there's this kind of there's this tension in the air that there's still a lot of work to be done. People really rallied around the building of the wall. Uh, success was coming very quickly. The work was moving forward very quickly. Um, you know, despite the overtures of, you know, Sanballat and his accomplices, Nehemiah and the others worked and worked and worked. They refused to come down from the wall. And the wall was all built up, which created a pretty significant, you know, more than a modicum of safety for them a pretty significant amount of safety, but now inside of the walls, there's still a lot of work to be done. And not just physical work in terms of rebuilding the, the buildings and, and you know, all of the, the, the various, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Basically the sewage and uh, water, and there's a lot that had to be done. What's the word I'm looking for there? Municipalities. I think is what I'm looking for. And, and just to make the city livable. And there's this kind of tension here where there's a great joy and a sense of relief and accomplishment that the wall is completed, but there's still so much work to be done. And not just work to be done physically, but work to be done in terms of the actual teaching of the law and of scripture to the people. Because of the intermarriage, because of the lengthy captivity and time away from the priests and from the temple, and from a routine of being the nation of Israel, right? At least in a you know calendar sense, uh, there's needs, and those needs are educational as well as structural and physical. And so that's what this chapter is about: the the building up not only of the city but primarily of the people. And there's an incredible verse, several incredible verses here that we'll get to in just a bit. So the first paragraph, this is page 630 of Types and Symbols. 661 of the original says, it was the time of the Feast of Trumpets. So it's in the fall. Many were gathered at Jerusalem. The scene was one of mournful interest. And that word mourn or mournful or mourned or mourning comes up quite a little bit in this chapter. The scene was one of mournful interest. The wall of Jerusalem had been rebuilt and the gates set up, but a large part of the city was still in ruins, right? There's the tension. Next paragraph. On a platform of wood erected in one of the broadest streets and surrounded on every hand by the sad reminders of Judah's departed glory, stood Ezra, now an aged man. At his right hand and left were gathered his brother Levites. Looking down from the platform, their eyes swept over a sea of heads. From all the surrounding country, the children of the covenant had assembled. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen. And they bowed their heads and worshiped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. Okay, so this is a ceremony. It's a dedication ceremony. This is an educational time, but it's also a celebratory time. But the temptation of many in attendance is to be mournful, to be sad, to not look primarily upon what has been accomplished, which was a great deal, not only the building of the temple itself, but now of the city wall. Rather than rejoicing in what had been accomplished, their temptation was to mourn over how much work was still to be done. And uh, let's continue to read. Next paragraph, it says, Yet even here was evidence of the sin of Israel through the intermarriage, and that's a theme that we've already been addressing and is going to come up not only in this chapter, but in the following chapter. Through the intermarriage of the people with other nations, the Hebrew language had become corrupted and great care was necessary on the part of the speakers, that is to say the teachers, the priests, Ezra and others, to explain the law and the language of the people that it might be understood by all. Certain of the priests and Levites, Levites united with Ezra in explaining the principles of the law. They read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped to understand the reading. Now, she's quoting here from Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. That's easy to remember, Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And let me just read it to you in the NIV. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So not only was there, in some cases, a language barrier and a problem with the Hebrew language, which of course the law was written in by Moses, but there was the problem of just a, an unfamiliarity with what it meant to be a Jew, 
right? That, that they had been so, I mean, generationally separated from their homeland, from their temple, from the regular practices and ceremonies of the sanctuary, that there is a total reorientation, recalibration, re-education process going on here. So again, we have these twin buildings or processes, the physical building of the city inside of the gates, and then also, of course, the building of the people. And this is further confounded by the fact that there has been a significant degree of intermarriage and the language, as we'll see also in the next chapter, has been corrupted. And people need to have the sense. I really like that, by the way. Gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. I'm going to keep reading here. It says, And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They listened intent and reverent to the words of the Most High. And as the law was explained, they were convinced of their guilt. They mourned. There it is again. Because of their transgressions, which is an appropriate response, right? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right? Mourning in response to a knowledge, a spirit-filled, poignant, incorrigible knowledge of our sins is something that brings about mourning and sadness and sometimes despair, which we'll get to. But this was a day, this day was a festival, a day of rejoicing, a holy convocation, a day which the Lord had commanded the people to keep with joy and gladness. And in view of this, they were bidden to restrain their grief, which is interesting, and to rejoice because of God's great mercy toward them. This day is holy to Yahweh your God, Nehemiah said. Do not mourn nor weep. Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Quoting here from also Nehemiah chapter 8, but this time verse 10. And I I love this. It's, it's a little counterintuitive, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the rubric. But I, I like the idea here that the natural temptation and inclination of the people, having been confronted in the reading of the law with their sinfulness, with their transgression, with their unfaithfulness and covenant breaking, their natural inclination, as with any genuine conversion, is to mourn, to be sad, to, to repent. But here, Nehemiah and the priests are like, this is not a day for mourning. This is not a day for sadness. This is a day for gladness. And they were basically commanded to be happy, which I have to be honest, I really like that. It's like, okay, there is, you know, in the words of Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything. And today is not the day for mourning. Today is the day for gladness. So turn that frown upside down and we're all going to be happy. And I love this line here. Do not be sad. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength or is our strength. Now, I want to tell you a quick little story, an autobiographical story here, my own experience. The first time I ever heard this verse, the joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, I immediately fell in love with it. And I didn't read it. It was quoted to me. And it was quoted to me in a very unusual circumstance, okay? And I, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I'm going to tell you a quick story. So many of you know that I became a follower of Jesus through a vegetarian restaurant. There was a restaurant in my town, Rapid City, South Dakota, that was called, unimaginatively enough, Veggies, which is a fine name, but right, it's like, uh, of course it's called Veggies, right? A vegetarian restaurant called Veggies. And I had become a follower of Jesus through the ministry of the people that own this restaurant. I had read the great controversy. I had asked, I mean, I, had, I went to the restaurant for like two years, asking questions, inquiring, making friends. And then eventually they gave me some Bible studies. And then I read the great controversy. And then eventually I even worked there for the better part of a year. But at, at the time where I was just before I started to work there, but when I was getting converted, I hadn't yet been baptized, but I was reading the Bible and I was reading through the Great Controversy and I was I was getting converted. There was a, a lot of Christian people that came um, to this restaurant. A lot of people came to the restaurant. The food was delicious. Mary and Tom um, still running a wonderful restaurant today now in Oklahoma uh, by the same name, Veggies. Uh, beautiful people, wonderful people that I love with all my heart. In fact, Mary, I don't just call Mary, I call her Mama Mary because that's what a lot of people called her, even back then, Mama Mary. And uh, Mama Mary is a force of nature. I mean, she's just, she is a 
powerful, spirit-filled, wonderful, evangelistic, praying woman of God. And she is responsible for, you know, the Holy Spirit, of course, but her and her restaurant responsible for my conversion. So I am eternally indebted to her and to her courage and her entrepreneurial spirit. She, she's an amazing woman. Okay, I could spend a lot of time talking about her. But anyway, because the food was so delicious and because Mary was so charismatic and wonderful, people would flock to this restaurant for lunch. And a lot of the people that would come were just people that were looking for a meal. But the word was on the street in Rapid City that this was a place that was owned by Christian people. And so a lot of Christian people, even non-vegetarian Christian people, would come and would just patronize the place, you know, just to be there to support. And one of the people that I met, and he was wonderful. I can see him in my mind's eye right now, and I haven't heard from him in over 20 years. But his name was Jerry. And Jerry had this amazing smile, and he had this cute little mustache. He was probably 35 at the time. I would have been like 25, so he was older than me. And he was a Christian. And he was the kind of Christian that just wore his Christianity right on his shirt sleeve. Like, like everybody knew he was a Christian. He was always praise the Lord and God is good and quoting scripture and God bless you. And I mean, he was unashamedly, unapologetically, unambiguously a Christian. And, uh, but he was quirky. I mean, like totally quirky, but in a good way. And uh, I, I got to talking to, to Jerry one day and I actually sat down and had lunch with him and we were just talking and, and he was an evangelical Christian. He knew that this was a restaurant that was owned by Seventh-day Adventists. I wasn't yet uh, a Seventh-day Adventist. I was just becoming a Christian. I was asking him questions, trying to learn from whoever I could. And he kind of started witnessing to me. And he asked me if I had ever spoken in tongues because he was a charismatic, evangelical, kind of a Pentecostal. And I told him that I didn't know what that meant. I, I said, I, I, I'm sorry, Jerry, I don't know what that means, speaking in tongues. And he said, oh, you, you don't know what it means to speak in tongues. And I said, no. And he was the most delightful guy. I, 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 even right now, just thinking about him just gives me so much joy in my heart. And he said, oh, I, I can teach you how to speak in tongues. And I was like, oh, okay, wh what, is, what is that? And he said, well, well, come with me. And uh, we went, this is a true story. We, we went to the back of the restaurant and uh, we walked out the back door where there was the loading dock. And he said, okay, um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to show you how to speak in tongues. And I was like, oh, okay. And he said, this is, you know, what it looks like when you're filled with the Spirit. And then, to my astonishment, because remember, I don't know really anything about the Christian faith. This is all new to me. I mean, I knew the basics. I knew God and creation and there was, you know, Jesus and resurrection because I was raised in an Episcopal church. But I had not heard of this tongues thing. This was new to me. Anyway, Jerry, to my astonishment, he just starts going... Habla, habla, shamana, habla, habla, habla. He starts doing something like that, but more impressive and, and better than me. And I was just, and, but he kind of closed his eyes, habla, 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 and I was just like, whoa, what is this? This is so wild. And when he was done, he opened up his eyes, and I think he was as surprised as I was that I hadn't also started speaking in tongues because I think he thought the spirit was just going to fall on me and I was going to go, whatever. So he just kind of looked at me and, and said, well, that's what it is. And you need to pray that you also can speak in tongues. And I was like, oh, okay. Hey, thanks for showing me that. And our food was still on our table. So this all happened very quickly. So we went back in and we sat down. It was one of the weirdest encounters of my whole life. And Jerry just had a huge smile on his face the whole time. And when, we, when he sat down, he said this to me. He said, listen, he said, it's a little weird the first few times. He said, but just remember this. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, the tongues thing had no, uh, had no attraction to me, had no purchase with me. It didn't, it didn't register with me at all. I was confused. But when he said, when we sat down back at the table and he said to me, just remember this, David. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And somehow that line just lodged itself. It just registered in my heart. And I, I said, what did you say? And he said, the joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 8.10. I immediately wrote down Nehemiah 8.10 on a verse of paper. I, again, this was before I was baptized. It's amazing that I remember this. But this verse just lodged itself in my mind, in my heart, and it was so rich to me. Wow, I love that. The joy of the Lord 
is our strength. Just think about that. God's joy, God's pleasure, God's happiness is the thing that strengthens us, empowers us, enables us. I mean, it is just so rich. And it has been with me ever since that day that I had lunch with Jerry, where he tried to teach me how to speak in tongues. And I've never forgotten that experience. And I've never forgotten this verse. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And I love the context of it here, where the people are kind of trapped in this mournful state, but they're being you know, they're encouraged that the wall is built, but they're mournful over how much work is still to be done. And it's a day of festivity, but they're tempted to mourn because the book of the law has been read. And they are a jumble of emotions. And Nehemiah, basically Ezra, uh, basically teaches them, is it Ezra or Nehemiah? Uh, excuse me, it's, uh, let's see, the Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and teachers of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, so it was all of them, Nehemiah, so it's Nehemiah that says this. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy the choice food, the sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I love that Nehemiah is here teaching people that it's okay to be joyful, to be glad, to rejoice. Yes, you're a sinner. Yes, you have failed. Yes, you have fallen. Yes, you have transgressed. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done. Yes, we're just coming out of 70 years of Babylonian captivity and a scattering among the Assyrians. Yes to all of that. And here we are back in the city, wall built, temple built, the reinstitution of the book of the law, the, the, the feasts are being kept and the priests are educating and being educated themselves. And this is a day for rejoicing. Don't be sorrowful today, Nehemiah said. There'll be a time to be sorrowful, but not today. That's not today. Today, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength for what? Your strength to do the work. Your strength to not be sad. Your strength to press on. Your strength to have hope. Friends, that verse needs to become, if it's not already, a feature of your experience with Jesus. Just say it again. Say it with me. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Or say our. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And I cannot tell you how many times this verse has been a supreme and powerful encouragement to me over the years. Okay, so I, I love that it comes up in this context. And then it says, the early part of the day was devoted to religious exercises and the people spent the remainder of the time in gratefully recounting the blessings of God. Yes, we have sinned. Yes, we have fallen. Yes, we have failed. Yes, we have been in captivity. But God has also worked. God has also wrought. God is also in the process of reformation and restoration. In fact, that's our next chapter, right? Restoration. So let's be glad. Or reformation is our next chapter. Let's be glad. The joy of the Lord is our strength today. Today is a day for rejoicing. Okay, top of the next page, page 632. I'm going to start reading here a little bit, uh, sort of the top of the page, as they listened, uh, excuse me, as they had listened from day to day to the words of the law, the people had been convicted of their transgressions and of the sins of their nation in past generations. They saw that it was because of a, a departure from God that his protecting care had been withdrawn and that the children of Abraham had been scattered in foreign lands and they determined to seek his mercy and to pledge themselves, that's an important word in this chapter, pledge to pledge themselves to walk in his commandments before entering upon this, this solemn service. Held on the second day after the close of the Feast of Tabernacles, they separated themselves from the heathen among them. So the reading of the law and they're under conviction. Next paragraph. As the people prostrated themselves before the Lord, confessing their sins, pleading for pardon, their leaders encouraged them to believe. Underline that. Be sure to underline that. The leaders encouraged them to believe something. To believe what? To believe that God, according to his promise, heard their prayers. They must not only mourn and weep and repent, but they must, here it is again, believe. Believe what? Believe that God had pardoned them. God had not brought them uh, an awareness and a, and a pricked conscience over their sin, only to leave them there wallowing in their sorrow and misery and mournful condition. God brought them there so they would feel their deep need and they would cry out for pardon and then they could believe that they were pardoned. 
This is, of course, the central truth of the sanctuary. And the priests are there teaching them about the blood of the lamb and the blood of the Passover and the blood of the sacrifices and how pardon works. The priests themselves, of course, don't fully understand it because it was all in images and types and in symbols. But insofar as they were able to understand it, the religious leaders are saying you have to believe that God hears your prayer and you have to believe that you are pardoned. And I'm saying this now to you. You have to believe that when you cry out after you have failed, after you have fallen, after you have sinned, when you cry out, you have to believe that God hears your prayer and then you believe that you are pardoned. Believe that God pardoned them. They must show their faith by recounting his mercies and then praising him for his goodness. Notice the sequence. We mourn our spiritual condition. We pray we believe that God hears our prayers. We believe that he pardons us. And then in response to the pardon that we now believe, as an, as an artifact of reality and of history, we now praise and rejoice because of what has happened in that transaction, in that moment. Now, again, of course, here on this particular day, in this circumstance, prior to the advent of Jesus, to his life, dear, life death, burial, and resurrection, they are looking forward in shadows and symbols to the coming of a promised Messiah and deliverer. But we have the wonderful, privileged position of looking back and knowing how this transaction happens. It happens through the blood of Jesus. So we confess and we believe that God hears our prayer and then we believe that we are pardoned and then we rejoice in the light of the fact and of the knowledge of the fact that we are pardoned. And that's what's taking place there. That's the gospel. That is what is taking place there, and it's absolutely amazing. It says, uh, they must show their faith by recounting his mercies and praising him for his goodness. Stand up, said these teachers, and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Then there's this incredible, you know, sort of uh, refrain that breaks out. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, and all their host the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. The song of praise ended. The leaders of the congregation related the history of Israel, showing how great had been God's goodness toward them and how great their ingratitude. Right? So they just continue. And what happens here in response to this ongoing education through the festivals, through the reading of the law, through the teaching of the Levites and others, is that the people become increasingly aware of not only their condition, but of God's promise of restoration, and they feel the unction of the desire to respond come over them, and they, they covenant with God, they pledge with God. And Ellen White uses that word over and over and over and over again in this chapter, right? In fact, I missed one there in that paragraph I read earlier, so I'm just going to highlight that. But she uses it again and again. Let me just read you a few of them here. This is all on page 633, 667 of the original. They had suffered punishment for their sins. Now they acknowledged the justice of God's dealings with them and pledged themselves to obey his law. Just a few uh, sentences later in that same paragraph, the people took a solemn oath to walk in God's law, which is just a way of saying they pledged themselves. Stay in that same paragraph right at the end. The oath taken at this time included a promise, which is just another word for a pledge, not to intermarry with the people of the land. Look at the next paragraph. Before the day of fasting ended, the people still further manifested their determination to return to the Lord by pledging themselves to cease from desecrating the Sabbath. A couple sentences later, Nehemiah bound them by a solemn covenant. Next paragraph. Provision was also made to support the public worship of God. In addition to the tithe, the congregation pledged themselves to contribute yearly a stated sum for the service of the sanctuary. And so again and again, on that page, again, page 633, 667 of the original, they pledged, they pledged, they pledged, they pledged. They took, they made a solemn covenant. They took a solemn oath. Top of the next page there, last page here in the chapter, page 634, very top of the page, 668, they had acknowledged the righteousness of God's dealings with them and had covenanted to obey his law. Now they must manifest faith in his promises. They must believe. 
They must believe that God would do what he said he would do. God had accepted their repentance. They were now to rejoice in the assurance of sins forgiven and the restoration to divine favor. I, I love the fact here, and I want you to feel this, that rejoicing and celebrating and praising is like commanded. I've said before here, and I'm, I'm quoting Ty Gibson, but I like this, that, that we don't think ourselves into right actions, we act ourselves into right thinking. And that's true. That, that, is, so, that is more true than the former. And, and that's what's going on here. In, in other words, what they're being told is, yes, there's a time for mourning, and yes, there's a time for sadness, and yes, there's a time for being keenly aware of our transgression, sin, and the sins of our ancestors. But right now that we have confessed and we have repented and we have believed the promises of God to restore, now they were to rejoice in the assurance of sins forgiven and their restoration to divine favor. And I feel that. I mean, I just feel like there are times where you need to tell yourself or you need to tell someone else, look, you need to praise God. You need to praise God right now. Give me five things that you're thankful for. Give me 10 things that you're thankful for. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heaven. I mean, just break out in the doxology. Break out in blessed assurance. Break out if you're a, you know, you love your praise songs. Break out in, um, uh, what's a great praise song? Waymaker, you know, uh, break out in song. Just start rejoicing, start believing. Like we can't, there is no, there is no Catholic sense in which there is merit in remaining in a forlorn, mournful, downcast condition when the promise of God is that deliverance and pardon have come and are available. Yes, repentance and, and mourning, entirely appropriate, and they have their time and they have their place. But after that has occurred, we're commanded to rejoice because the absence of rejoicing is an absence of belief. You don't really believe that what you say has happened has actually happened. And when we rejoice and when we praise God for what he has done, all of a sudden, something starts changing inside of us and we begin to believe more firmly and more, more uh, profoundly the great promise that pardon is ours and restoration is ours. Not just that it will be in some abstract future sense, but that it is. I want to read the last few paragraphs here. Nehemiah's effort to restore the worship of the true God had been crowned with success. As long as the people were true to the oath that they had taken, as long as they were obedient to God's word, so long would the Lord fulfill his promise by pouring rich blessings upon them. This is just another way. This paragraph is just describing the covenantal relationship. I will be their God and they will be my people. Second to the last paragraph, for those who are convicted of sin and weighed down with a sense of their unworthiness, there are lessons of faith and of encouragement in this record. The Bible faithfully presents the results of Israel's apostasy, but it portrays also the deep humiliation and repentance, the earnest devotion and generous sacrifice that marked their seasons of return to the Lord. Because again, there is no merit in sadness for sadness sake. There is no merit in mourning for mourning's sake. Sadness and mourning are supposed to get us somewhere. Where do they get us? They get us to an awareness that we need a savior. And once we get that awareness and we call out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, save me, I perish. We are then under gospel obligation to believe that God has heard us, right? Remember that? They were to have, they were to believe that God, according to the promise, had heard their prayers. And then they must believe that God had pardoned them. We are under gospel obligation to believe and then we are under further gospel obligation to rejoice. So sometimes you just have to look yourself in the mirror or you have to look a dear brother or a dear sister in the eye or they have to look you in the eye and say, cut it out. Cut it out. Let's sing the doxology. Let's praise. Let's rejoice. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And then the last paragraph, every true turning to the Lord brings abiding joy into the life. There it is. That's a promise. That's a promise. Underline that. Every true turning to the Lord brings abiding joy into the life. It's a command. And not an arbitrary command, but a command that will necessarily occur and actualize and materialize 
when we genuinely understand and believe the gospel, the gospel of God's wonderful pardon and forgiveness through Jesus. When a sinner yields to the influence of the Holy Spirit, he sees his own guilt and defilement in contrast with the holiness of the great searcher of hearts. He sees himself condemned as a transgressor, but he is not because of this to give way to despair. Aha! For this pardon has already been secured, already been secured. He may rejoice in the sense of sins forgiven, in the love of a pardoning heavenly father. Come on now. It is God's glory. Oh, this is the best sentence in the whole chapter. It is God's glory to encircle sinful, repentant human beings in the arms of his love to bind up their wounds, to cleanse them from sin, and to clothe them with the garments of salvation. Yes, you guessed it. That last paragraph is an all-time paragraph, and it went into the all-time registry. We've got quite a few in the all-time registry now. In fact, let me just quickly count how many are in there because we've added quite a few lately. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is the 12th ent entry in the all-time registry. The last paragraph of chapter 56 is amazing. And just a little heads up, it also happens to be my promise in the rubric. And speaking of the rubric, let's turn to that now because we need to, we need to motor along, don't we? Okay. Um, here's what I wrote. I wrote, wow, what a beautiful and encouraging chapter. So much gospel in this chapter. Let's do the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. What's the point? The point is God's law brings conviction and a strong sense of condemnation and unworthiness. Okay, that's true. But the gospel communicated through faith, belief, gives joy and a sense of sins forgiven in the love of a pardoning heavenly father. And I'm just quoting there from that last paragraph. So yes, the law does what the law does, but the gospel does what the gospel does. Does the law bring us down in some sense? Yes, it does, especially when we are coming to the law not primarily as a guardrail or as a, as a teacher, but when we're coming out of sin and out of rebellion and out of captivity, and we see the law and we feel the incredible contrast between the law and us, between the holiness of the law and our own unholiness that we know intimately and incorrigibly. We know it. And so the law can press us down. But the point of the law is to press us down so that we feel our need of a Savior, and then the gospel lifts us up. Okay, what about the person? Here's how I wrote this. God convicts to convince to convert. Don't you like that? God convicts to convince to convert. God convicts us of sin to, to, he convicts us of sin to convince us of the truth of the gospel and of our need of the gospel and of the accuracy of the law's diagnosis of our condition. So God convicts to convince to convert. Because once we see that the law is not something that we have or ever could measure up to except through the righteousness of Christ, then it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. And so he convicts to convince to convert. All right, the prayer. How do we pray this chapter? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Please give me the twin senses of unworthiness and pardon. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. The twin senses of unworthiness and pardon. Uh, how do we practice this chapter? Sometimes you have to make the active and intentional and even counterintuitive choice to be glad and rejoice. You, you've just got to say, you know what? I'm going to be glad and rejoice because the gospel is true. God has heard my prayer and my sins are pardoned. And therefore, I'm telling myself, Rejoice and be glad, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then the promise, as I've already said, is the last paragraph. Let's read it again, shall we? This all-time paragraph, the last paragraph. Every true turning to the Lord brings abiding joy into the life. Amen and amen. When a sinner yields to the influence of the Holy Spirit, he sees his own guilt and defilement in contrast with the holiness of the great searcher of hearts. He sees himself condemned as a transgressor. But he is not because of this to give way to despair. Oh, no. For his pardon has already been secured. 
He may rejoice in the sense of sins forgiven, in the love of a pardoning Heavenly Father. It is God's glory to encircle sinful, repentant human beings in the arms of his love, to bind up their wounds, to cleanse them from sin, and to clothe them with the garments of salvation. 10 out of 10. I mean, that's just as good as it can be. That's my promise. And let's now go quickly to our word. What it, <laughs> uh, Dan Pierre says, sometimes you have to give yourself a stern talking to. That's exactly right. Okay, what's your word, everyone? We've still got another chapter to do, which, we'll, which we will motor through. Uh, but what's your word? KB Photog says 11 out of 10. Yeah, I agree. Okay, here we go. Tennessee Quiltbug says twin senses. Hmm, I'll come back to that in just a second. Rejoice. Rejoice is another one. Abiding, covenant, searcher, rejoice, return. Joy, says Deb Snyder. I like that. Pardon, says Melly. Rejoice, rejoice. Okay, there's going to be a lot of rejoices here, which is a great word. It really captures the chapter. Restoration, says Pam. Uh, pardon, says grace, peace, and blessings. That's either Reiner or Alice. Joy, says Cassandra. Joy, says KB Photog. Mourn, says Jamie. Covenant, says, uh, it's hard, hard for me to tell what name that is. Uh, joyous, reconsecration, believe, believe, rejoice. Reacquainted, says Arlene. I really like that. Believe, oh, great word. Perfect, perfect. Rejoice, already. Believe, believe recounting. Michelle just gives the, the heart eyes emoji, which is a great one. Restoration, secured, believe, grace. Yeah, pledge or pledging. Stefan's three words. Okay, here we go, Stefan. You get your three-word dispensation. Clemency, jubilation, and practice. Clemency is great. Jubilation is great. Practice is great. All of those excellent. Hey, Jennifer, Jill. Encircle, oh, such a great word, such a great word. Yeah, God encircles us in his arms of love. Um, yield, mournful, those are terrible Terry's two words. Okay, let me tell you what, my word is sense. Sense, S-E-N-S-E, -E. and it's because Ellen White uses that word, and I was a little surprised that nobody else had it, um, but I love the word encircle. That's probably my second favorite word. But I love the word sense. First of all, as you would have noticed, the word sense occurs in that last chapter, but it also occurs in the penultimate chapter, the chapter that's second to the last. And it also occurs back at the very beginning. Did you notice this? This is in the third paragraph. Remember that, that when the, the teachers of the law were reading and trying to help people to understand what the law was saying, let me remind you what it says. They read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And to me, that's what this whole chapter is about. It's about getting a sense of what God is trying to do in our lives. God wants us to have a sense of what the law teaches and a sense of our sinfulness and a sense of our separation from him apart from the gospel and a sense of our reconnection with him through the gospel and a sense of the joy that necessarily follows and a sense of our pardon and of his encircling arms around us. So she opens with sense and then she closes. She's quoting there from Nehemiah 8, uh, verse 8. And then she closes. Let me just read this. Uh, first sentence of the second to the last chapter. For those who are convicted of sin and weighed down with a sense of their unworthiness. You see that? That's what I mean by twin senses. The first sense here in these last two paragraphs is a sense of our unworthiness an awareness of our unworthiness. But notice the sense in the last paragraph. I've already read it twice, so I'll just read, starting right in the middle. He sees himself condemned as a transgressor. We have a sense of our sin. But he is not because of this to give way to despair, for his pardon has already been secured. He may rejoice in the sense of sins forgiven. So friends, we have to have these twin senses, senses, these twin awarenesses. We are aware that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are aware, we have the sense that we are forgiven, that our sins are pardoned, and that we are, in the words of the Apostle Paul, accepted in the beloved. So that's, uh, that's uh, why I went with sense. Um, let's quickly now do 
uh, chapter 57, Reformation. Reformation. Uh, this is another great chapter. Basically, this is based on Nehemiah chapter 13. And I really liked this chapter. I'm going to kind of motor through it. It's a, it's a fairly straightforward chapter. This is the last chapter in Nehemiah. Also, coincidentally, it's the last chapter in section six of Prophets and Kings. So this is going to close out not only the book of Nehemiah, but it closes out section six. And then all we have left are the last three chapters of section seven, which is light at eventide. And every one of those has, you know, unmistakable whispers of the Messiah to come. Let's just remind ourselves of those chapter titles. The coming of a deliverer, that's tomorrow. The house of Israel and visions of future glory. So all of those are going to be steeped in, in incredible messianic significance and profundity and fulfillment and prophecy. So this chapter, chapter 57, is based on the last chapter of Nehemiah, and it's also kind of the last chapter of the book, in the sense that what comes after this in section 7 is kind of an epilogue, right? In that intertestamental period between the minor prophets and Matthew, right? In that, in that period of several centuries where there is a longing for and a looking for and an anticipation of Messiah. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, but I thought this was a really uh, great chapter, a really straightforward chapter. Uh, there are a series of reforms that are instituted in this chapter, uh, described in Nehemiah 13 by Nehemiah. Let's just read the first paragraph, shall we? Solemnly and publicly, the people of Judah had pledged themselves to obey the law of God. There's our word pledged again. But when the influence of Ezra and Nehemiah was for a time withdrawn, there were many who departed from the Lord. Nehemiah had returned to Persia. During his absence from Jerusalem, evils crept in that threatened to pervert the nation. Idolaters not only gained a foothold in the city, but contaminated by their presence, the very precincts of the temple. Wow. Through intermarriage, ah, there it is again. Let's quickly highlight that, underline that. Through intermarriage, a friendship had been brought about between Eliashib, the high priest, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. Whoa, talk about an unexpected and unnecessary friendship, but there it is in the historical record nonetheless. Israel's bitter enemy. As a result of this unhallowed alliance, which just means unholy alliance, Eliashib had permitted Tobiah to occupy an apartment connected with the temple? <laughs> what? What am I reading? Which until then had been used as a storeroom for tithes and offerings of the people? What on earth is going on here? And if, if you find yourself with this sense of total incredulity and surprise, well, that's exactly how Nehemiah feels when he finds out about it, right? So, so in the next paragraph, she basically says, what? What on earth is this about? She, she actually says that there would have been almost no greater offense that, that could have been done to God and to his covenant than this, to invite one of the enemies of Nehemiah, one of the enemies of God and of the restoration and rebuilding that had been taking place under Nehemiah into the temple. It, I mean, it just boggles the mind, just utterly boggles the mind. But, but the reason here is, as we'll see at the end of the chapter, this intermarriage, right? This intermarriage, basically it's family. And so now the third paragraph, on returning from Persia, this is uh, page 637, 670 of the original. On returning from Persia, that's how the paragraph begins, Nehemiah learned of the bold profanation and took prompt measures to expel the intruder. It grieved me bitterly, he declares. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms and brought, them, brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Nehemiah gets back and is astonished at this what does Ellen White call it there? Contempt. This contempt for God and for his temple throws all the stuff out, cleanses the place, kind of fumigates it, right? And then puts all of the original storage items back in. Um, she then says, uh, let's, just read, let's read uh, that next paragraph. Not only had the temple been profaned, but the offerings had been misapplied. Well, of course, I mean, any priest, Eliashib, who lacked the discernment to have this kind of a relationship with Tobiah is not going to be somebody that the rank and file of Israel is going to have a lot of confidence in. So what ends up happening is, is that they lost their zeal and fervor and they were reluctant to pay their tithes. Of course, 
Th this happens even today too, right? Like you have a, a deadbeat pastor and a dead church and you know money's being mismanaged and misused and misspent. Well, people are not enthusiastic about giving their hard-earned money and resources to a project that they think is a complete waste of time, right? So, so when the spirituality and the sincerity and the authenticity of God's workers goes down, God's priests and God's pastors, goes, when that goes down, well, then that has a direct result on the rank and file that are like, I, I think I'm going to watch the football game, right? Like it's, it's no, it's no excuse to be clear. It's not an excuse because our faith is not in people. It's not in pastors. It's not in churches or buildings, but it is at least understandable why some people, especially those that are weak in the faith or new in the faith or young in the faith that are like, ah, uh, the pastor had an affair. The pastor was embezzling money. The pastor is, you know, behaving in ways that are untoward. I think I'll just watch the football game. I think I'll go golfing. I think I'll go whatever. I mean, that's an actual thing. It's the way that people's minds work. I'm not saying that it's right, but is it understandable? Of course it is. Is it justified? No, I don't think it's justified, but it's at least understandable. And that's what she's describing in that next paragraph. But now this is really quite cool. I got to tell you a really cool thing that happened when I was reading this. The next paragraph begins, Nehemiah set to work to correct these abuses, right? He, immediately, Nehemiah gets to work. He is what the Australians would call a goer. That's one of my favorite things that the Australians would say, oh, he's a goer or she's a goer. In other words, they're the kind of person that gets things done. They're the kind of person that makes things go, right? Nehemiah is a goer. He's a doer. He's, he's somebody that accomplishes things. He sees a problem, he fixes it. He sees a wall, he rebuilds it. He sees, you know, Tobiah, or what's the guy's name? Tobias, is that it? Uh, Tobiah, you know, living in the house, he throws the stuff out. He's a doer, he's a goer. He's somebody that makes things happen. So Nehemiah set to work to correct these abuses. He gathered together those who had left the service of the Lord's house and set them in their place. This inspired the people with confidence and all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil. Men who were considered faithful were made treasurers over the storehouse and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Okay, you know what I wrote here in my margin? I wrote in my margin, leadership. And then I wrote two words, like Hezekiah. I was immediately reminded of Hezekiah's passion, of Hezekiah's reforms. I actually went back and, and skimmed over the, the chapter that we had several chapters on Hezekiah, but the one in particular that was on his leadership was, let me just remind you of that chapter in case you want to go back and read it as well. Um, I am, am I going too far? Yeah, I've gone too far. Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Okay, the chapter that I really loved with regards to his leadership was, I think it was this chapter here. Yes, chapter 30, chapter 30. Now, now the reason that I bring this up is that at the very end of this chapter, and I didn't know this, Ellen White compares Nehemiah to Hezekiah. So I was just so happy that that happened. I was like, man, this guy sounds like Hezekiah. I love his leadership. I love his let's do it attitude. Let's make something happen. Let's reform. Let's put, let's, you know, get good people, train them, educate them, put them in charge, delegation. I was like, this guy's like Hezekiah. And then Ellen White at the end of the chapter is like, Nehemiah was like Hezekiah, which I loved. Um, then she begins to talk about the profaning of the Sabbath, which you can read about. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, not because it's unimportant, but because I've got to trim the edges somewhere. She talks about the Sabbath and how Nehemiah makes great efforts to drive the people away. In fact, at one point he says, I, I love this. He says, uh, why do you spend the night around the wall? Because he's already kicked out these merchants that come on the Sabbath to try to entice the people of Jerusalem into buying and selling on the Sabbath. And, and they've come back, I like the way she says it, not inclined to abandon their purpose. The merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. In other words, if you've ever been in a situation where you're being hounded by people that are trying to sell you something, I mean, this happens like crazy in certain areas. I mean, I don't want to say any countries here, but I've been to some countries where it's like, on two occasions, I have literally paid somebody to leave me alone, right? They're selling some knickknack, some widget that I am not interested in. But what I do want is a little peace and quiet. And I'll say, how much do you want for the widget? 
and they say, da, 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 whatever the amount is, and it's like $3. And then I say, okay, how about this? Here's the equivalent of $3, but I don't want the widget because I don't have any room in my luggage, but I want you to go away. Okay, so you, you got your sale. So can you go away now? I, I've two times paid people to leave. And on the first occasion, the person thanked me and left, kept their little widget. And on the second occasion, no sooner had the person taken my $3 and I didn't get a widget, you know, the thing that he was trying to sell me, I think it was a little flute or something. Um, then he immediately tries to upsell me to some kind of a little guitar. I'm like, friend, I wasn't that clear? I was actually paying you to go away. Um, not because I'm not happy to, you know, help the local, you know, economy here, but because you're really badgering me. It's, it's all a bit much. So, so that's what she's describing here, right? Like, like I have no problem with somebody trying to sell me something and, you know, you go to other countries and I understand I'm an American and they hear my accent and they think that I'm just made of money and I'm very happy to help people out. But sometimes people are over the top. They're obnoxious. And uh, on at least two occasions, as I say, I've just paid people to go away. One time it worked, one time it didn't. But, but that's what's going on here, right? These merchants are like, what do you mean go away? We're not going away. So when Nehemiah sees that they've camped outside of the wall, he is a little less um, savvy than me, right? He doesn't say, look, I'll pay you to go away. This is what he says. Why did you spend the night around the wall? He demanded, if you do so again, I will lay hands on you. <laughs> I mean, I love that. Nehemiah is a man's man. He's a dude. He is no wuss. He is tough, tough as nails, filled with the spirit, a godly man, a, 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 an educator, a hard worker, a principled man. He's a man. He's a full man. And he's like, look, I told you to go away. And if I come out here again and you've got all of your little markets set up in your little stalls on the Sabbath, I'm going to lay hands on you. Now, the NIV softens that a little bit and says, I will arrest you. Okay. Okay. But I like, I will put hands on you. It actually kind of appeals to my, I don't know. I like the way that that sounds. Um, so anyway, so, but what's going on here? And then after she deals with the Sabbath, she gets into the larger, more important issue, which is again, the issue of intermarriage, right? She says that now Nehemiah again, or turned his attention to the danger that it again threatened Israel from intermarriage and association with idolaters. And the thing that I thought was so interesting is that, is this the part where, let me just see if this is the part here. She says, uh, top of page 639, uh, looks like 674 of the original, these unlawful alliances were causing great confusion in Israel for some who entered into them were men in high positions, rulers to whom the people had a right to look for counsel and a safe example. Foreseeing the ruin before the nation, if this evil were allowed to continue, Nehemiah reasoned earnestly with the wrongdoers, pointing to the case of Solomon, which I thought was fascinating. He reminded them that among all the nations, there had arisen no king like this man to whom God had given great wisdom, yet idolatrous women had turned his heart from God and his example had corrupted Israel. Should we then hear, Nehemiah sternly demanded, of your doing all this great evil? You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Now, this is quite interesting. In Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26, let me just read you this from the NIV because I thought it was really well communicated. Nehemiah 13, 26, this is Nehemiah speaking. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we now hear that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? I, I love the fact here that he goes back to the Solomonic reign and basically says, look, Solomon was a heck of a lot smarter than you guys. I mean, he, he was a king that was so great. There was no king like him in that time in all the surrounding nations. And he couldn't navigate the complexities of marrying people that don't share your faith, your, your convictions, your values, and your traditions. So what do you think you're doing? That's basically what he says. What are you doing? And not only does he kind of rebuke them, he basically 
annuls all of these marriages, which, you know, uh, there we could spend some time talking about the theology of this. And I, I have actually read some things over the years on exactly how this works theologically. It's a little bit like, you know, Abraham Lincoln with the sort of provisional suspension of the, you know, constitution in order to uh, sort of forward what he thought was right for the Union in the context of the Civil War and, and, the, and the war with the South. It's like, uh, that's not legal and that's not okay, but, you know, men that are doers and goers, sometimes they just say, this is what we're doing. And there are some pretty interesting and I would even say thorny theological issues here, yeah, which I'm obviously not going to get into right now, but we can read it for the historical awareness that Nehemiah just took the situation into his own hands and he basically told these people, here's your choice. Here's your choice. You're going to either leave your idolatrous pagan wives or you're going to leave covenant with God. Now, that sounds wild to us, perhaps, but let's remember that in the previous chapter, in Nehemiah's chapter 8, 9, and 10, and in the previous chapter, these people had pledged, remember all those words? Pledged, 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 took an oath, covenanted, took a solemn oath. These are the same people that have then gone on in subsequent months and years to intermarry with the very people that had been responsible for the fall of Israel. So, so it's not a good situation here by any means. And Nehemiah basically says, you've broken your pledge and you're going to either keep your pledge to God, or you're going to keep your marriage to your idolatrous spouse, but you're not going to do both. And again, this is a specific situation in a specific time, uh, urgent, critical, emergency circumstance that is not easily transferable to other situations. I want to be clear about that. I mean, I'm just going to make that sort of, you know, broad statement here about the nature of how this passage is to be understood and applied practically in 2024. It doesn't mean that we can just annul uh, you know, our marriage because we've suddenly decided that we no longer like our spouse or we don't think our spouse is spiritual enough or godly enough, or maybe we married somebody as an unbeliever. We were both unbelievers and then we became a believer, but they didn't. And now we think we have license based on Nehemiah 13 to divorce. None of that's the case. Because Jesus will later say, obviously, in the Sermon on the Mount, that there is a single cause for which divorce was permissible uh, under Moses, and Jesus is saying under, under the teaching of Scripture, and that is adultery. So, so this was a specific emergency circumstance and situation that is not uniformly or easily applicable to just any old frustration that you might have with your spouse. But it is, again, a testament to just how dire, how urgent the situation was, and how much of a goer, a doer, Nehemiah was. He's like, hey, get your markets out of here, and if you show up on Sabbath again, I'm going to lay hands on you. And then he tells these people, hey, look, you're going to choose between your wife or you're going to choose between Yahweh, but you're not going to have both. Not here, not in this city. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, if you go out that, that God can't have his way with you. But in terms of being in this city, you know, the in, obviously the influence here is so egregious, so terrible, so preposterous that, that Tobiah was given a place to live in the temple by Eliashib. I mean, come on. This is a dire situation and circumstance. Nehemiah accurately and urgently diagnoses the problem. And then he just, <laughs> he just lays hands. In fact, the Bible actually says that he, he lays hands on some of these men. Um, let me read you that, actually. I don't, I'm not one to shy away from what Scripture says, so let me just read you that. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to, I made, and then you are not to give your daughters. I beat them and pulled out their hair and made them take an oath. Again, now this is, Nehemiah, let's remind ourselves here, is not our example in all things. Only Jesus is our example in all things. And this is an important place where we need to remind ourselves 
that not everything in Scripture is expressly prescriptive, that it is that many things in Scripture are historically descriptive, okay? Describing what happened, not prescribing how we should act in 2024, right? There is a difference here. We have to make a distinction between descriptive and prescriptive passages of Scripture. And I'm not here suggesting that Nehemiah didn't even do what was right in that situation. I mean, wasn't it, was it Phineas who, you know, ran a javelin through uh, a, a couple, uh, a, a, a Jew and a, a pagan that were, you know, having sex? That's not license for us to do the same, right? The, the Bible is very often describing historically and, and culturally what took place then. It's not licensed for us to go beating people up and pulling out their beards and annulling their marriages. I think you know all of this, but I'm just saying it anyway, because these passages are describing accurately, and some of these things are sometimes a little bit like, whoa, I didn't see that coming, right? But Nehemiah, again, senses the urgency of the moment with the marriages, and he says, not anymore, and he just draws a sharp line. Um... Let's see, what more could be said here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just quickly jump over to, just to get a sense for how egregious this intermarriage was, jump over to the bottom of page 639, types and symbols, 674 of the original paragraph begins, there were some in sacred office. Okay, let's read this to get a feel for the shape of the severity and urgency of the situation. There were some in sacred office who pleaded for their heathen wives, declaring that they could not bring themselves to separate from them. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like Adam in Eden, right? That sounds like Adam. He, he could not live without Eve. And so if having to choose between Eve and Yahweh, Adam chose Eve, right? And, and these men uh, would not be the first nor the last to choose a woman over God. But no distinction was made, no respect was shown for rank or position. Whoever among the priests or rulers refused to sever his connection with idolaters excuse me, was immediately separated from the service of the Lord. A grandson of the high priest, okay, we already know that he's a bit of a deadbeat, Eliashib, having married a daughter, blah, 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 what? Of the notorious Sanballat, was not only removed from office, but promptly banished from Israel. Remember them, O oh my God, Nehemiah prayed, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Okay, so you have a daughter of Sanballat, the, what was he, the, I forgot what he was. He was from somewhere. We have a daughter of Sanballat, the guy that's been like harassing and lying and seeking to deceive Nehemiah from the jump, right from the very beginning, marrying the high priest's grandson? Did I get that right? So you can see this is a real situation. This is not sustainable. And what it's going to do is it's going to lead Israel inevitably and invariably right back into the same situation that had happened already that led to their captivity, rebellion, rebellion, captivity, and exile. She then says, next paragraph, bottom of page 639, how much anguish of soul is needed, or this needed, let me read that again, how much anguish of soul this needed severity cost the faithful worker for God the, ju the judgment alone will reveal. That's kind of a difficult sentence to read. I'm going to read that again just so I can read it well and right. How much anguish of soul this needed severity cost the faithful worker for God, the judgment alone will reveal. That's how it's supposed to go. There was a constant struggle with opposing elements and only by fasting, humiliation, and prayer was advancement made. She then describes that some of these people went out and were received by the Samaritans who sort of turned up the volume on their Jewishness. Remember, the Samaritans are those that had intermarried in the Assyrian scattering Jews and non-Jews. And so they, in this situation, sort of turned up their Jewishness and received some of these people that were outcasts. And then Ellen White, in the, in the last three pages, largely just gives practical application of Nehemiah as a reformer. And there are some really great paragraphs here, and I want to at least read them. Top of page 641, uh, 677 looks like, maybe in the original, the success attending Nehemiah's efforts. Let's read that. The success attending Nehemiah's efforts shows what prayer, faith, and wise, energetic action will accomplish. 
Again, a goer, a doer. Not somebody to sit idly by and let life happen to him. Nehemiah was happening to life in the power of the Spirit. Nehemiah was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He made no pretension to a high title. He was a reformer raised up for an important time. It was his aim to set his people right with God. Inspired with a great purpose, he bent every energy of his being to its accomplishment. High, unbending integrity marked his efforts. As he came into contact with evil and opposition to right, to uh, opposition to right, he took so determined a stand that the people were roused to labor with fresh zeal and courage. They could not but recognize his loyalty, his patriotism, and his deep love for God. And seeing this, they were willing to follow where he led. Again, he was an inspiring and certainly an imposing figure. The next paragraph's amazing as well. Let's read that. Industry in a God-appointed duty is an important part of true religion. Men should seize circumstances as God's instruments with which to work his will. Prompt and decisive action at the right time will gain glorious triumphs, while delay and neglect result in failure and dishonor to God. If the leaders in the cause of truth show no zeal, if they are indifferent and purposeless, the church will be careless, indolent, which means lazy, and pleasure-loving. But if they are filled with a holy purpose to serve God and Him alone, the people will be united, hopeful, eager. That's a great paragraph. And the next paragraph's great as well. I want to read that as well. The Word of God abounds in sharp and striking contrasts. Sin and holiness are placed side by side. That beholding, we may shun the one and accept the other. The pages that describe the hatred, falsehood, and treachery of Sanballat and Tobiah describe also the nobility, devotion, and self-sacrifice of Ezra and Nehemiah. We are left free to copy either as we choose. Mm, that's great writing. The fearful results of transgressing God's commandments are placed over against the blessings resulting from obedience. We ourselves must decide whether we will suffer the one or enjoy the other. All three of those paragraphs are outstanding. Just absolutely outstanding. She then goes on to describe Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah as, she calls them several things, guardians, keepers, and repairers. And it's on this page, the second to the last page, page 642, 678 of the original, where she compares Nehemiah to King Hezekiah. She says right at the bottom of that last, uh, right at the last sentence of that paragraph there, like King Hezekiah, Nehemiah held fast to Yahweh. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments and Yahweh was with him. I just love the fact that early on, I was like, man, this decisive wise leadership reminds me of Hezekiah. And then at the very end of the chapter, I have to admit, I was, I was pretty chuffed. I was pretty happy that she's like, this is like Hezekiah. And then, of course, she quotes uh, from Isaiah, the repairs of the breach. She quotes from Isaiah 58. And let's just read now the last paragraph, last paragraph of section six. In many ways, kind of the last paragraph of the book proper, because again, the next three chapters are all about an anticipation of Messiah to come. They're kind of the epilogue, right? And uh, so this last paragraph is really significant. Let's read it. In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. The breach made in the law at the time the Sabbath was changed by man is to be repaired. She's describing the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, that he will think to change times and laws, that there will be a change in the very law of God or an attempted change. God's remnant people standing before the world as reformers are to show that the law of God is the foundation of all enduring reform and that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is to stand as a memorial of creation and a constant reminder of the power of God. Yes, in clear, distinct lines, they are to present the necessity of obedience to all the precepts of the Decalogue, constrained by the love of Christ. Notice how she holds both of them in her hands. Yes, the Decalogue, that is to say the Ten Commandments, the law, but constrained, compelled, pressed forward by what? The love of Christ. Constrained by the love of Christ, they are to cooperate with him in building up the waste places. They are to be repairers of the breach, restorers of paths, to dwell in. 
So notice all this language that she uses. Repairers, restorers, reformers, guardians, keepers. And in describing this, she is talking about people like Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah in this post-exilic period. What's called Second Temple Judaism. The Second Temple has been built. The post-exilic period. We are right on the edges now of the intertestamental period, which is that long period of several centuries between the end of the Minor Prophets and the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, let's get to our rubric. And um, what do we have here? What do we have here? Um, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. You guys ready? Here we go. The point. Uh, my point is just three words. You ready? Reform requires reformers. Reform requires reformers. Zerubbabel, yes. Nehemiah, yes. Ezra, yes. All reformers. God has a desire to see reform. God longs to see reform. But at the end of the day, God is to some significant degree by his own decision, reliant on the decisions of human beings that are made in his image. And therefore, reform requires reformers. Could angels or God himself uh, come down and teach far better? Well, of course, the answer is yes. And that's going to happen when the great reformer, capital R reformer, comes in Christ in the New Testament. But prior to that, there were many lowercase r reformers, people like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel. So reform requires reformers. Okay, the person, what do we learn about God here? God raises up reformers, restorers, and repairers to carry forward his will and his work. God is a delegator. As I've said many times before, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's kind of true that in Scripture, God is presented as only doing what only he can do. God only does what only God can do. If something can be delegated, God delegates it. And God delegated the work of reform and rebuilding and restoration to these men and their associates. God raises up reformers, restorers, and repairers. How do we pray this chair? God, make me one of those end time repairers of the breach described in Isaiah 58. First, of course, by the gospel, repair me. Because only someone that is repaired can be a repairer, right? Only somebody that's fixed can be a fixer. And so God, repair me by the gospel, continue to repair me by the gospel, that I may be a repairer in the times in which we live. The godless, rebellious, unusual times in which we live. I want to be a repairer of the breach. And this is, of course, quoting from the great passage in Isaiah 58, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, the practice. Here's what I wrote. Do and dare for God. Be bold. Get after it. Make something happen. Don't just sit on the sidelines or on the fence. Right? Be a goer. Do something. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can just be a thing. You know, Nike is already taken the, the slogan, just do it, but they're not wrong, right? That's the idea here. Like, like remember, Nehemiah was discouraged. He was the cupbearer. He was depressed. He was in the presence of Artaxerxes. And, and finally, the unction of the Spirit comes upon him that he's the one. He's the guy. I mean, think about it this way. Did Nehemiah have a position that was significant and important in the court of Artaxerxes? Yes, he did. But, but he was only filling and fulfilling a fraction of his potential. He might have thought up to that point that he was fulfilling his God-given potential and role. But in fact, that was only preliminary to the real thing to which God had called Nehemiah to do and to be. And that was one of the great reformers and rebuilders and restorers and repairers in all of biblical history. Right? So, so very often, you just have to do something. And when the unction of the Spirit comes upon us, like the unction of the Spirit came upon Nehemiah, you, you just got to do something. It might be a seemingly small thing. Okay, fine. Do a small thing. A small thing is better than no thing. Uh, do a medium thing. A medium thing is better than no thing. 
right? And it's better than a small thing, perhaps. So, so just do something, right? Like the Lord put these with DA reading challenges onto my heart. He gave me an unction of the Spirit. I almost felt like I didn't have a choice in the matter. I mean, of course I did, but I just felt like God was pressing me to do this, and now it's taken on a life of its own. We've been through, you know, one, we've been through a number of books. We've developed a community. We've, I mean, literally, thousands, I think we're up to like 2 million hours of watch time now. It might even be more than that. I haven't looked at the, the data on it recently, but it's like, it's either right at or right past 2 million hours of watch time in the With DA reading challenges between Instagram and YouTube. This was a very seemingly small thing that God has grown into a bigger thing, right? So, so God laid that on my heart and praise his name, I responded to the unction of the Spirit. So just do something, right? That's the practice here. Do something, do something. Might be a small thing, might be a seemingly tiny thing. Do it anyway. Do it. Do it for God. Do and dare for God. Put yourself out there. And before you know it, God will start to grow your platform, grow your influence, and not in the social media sense. That's not what I mean. I mean, just make you a force for good in the world. Like Mary Burnt that I described earlier with her restaurant. Man, she is a force for good in the world. She runs a restaurant. She's done it for decades. And God has used her to powerfully and profoundly impact the lives of thousands of people. And God can do something similar through you. Maybe not a restaurant, maybe not a with DA reading challenge, but whatever you come up with, you and God are going to come up with something really great, really awesome, and I, I can't wait to hear about it. Okay, then, as you might have imagined, my promise is Isaiah 58, verses 12 to 14. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwelling, with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way or doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in Yahweh and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the high places of the land, and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. So that's my promise. I want to be one of those people that is, at the end, a restorer and a repairer. And I want to know, oh, out to chat says, that was my promise too. All right. A lot of people saying that was their promise. Outstanding. Okay. What was your word? All right, everybody, let's wrap this up. What was your word? Okay, T.L. Hahn says repairers. That was also my word. Terrible Terry, Golden Girl has the same word. Repairers, repairers. Lots of repair. Perfect. Great. We all have, well, not we all, but many of us have the same word. Here's visionary extortion. Somebody says Isaiah 58 is one of their favorite chapters. They memorized it. That's great. Repair, yoke, repairers, do. Great word. Unbending. Great word. Guardians, respect, repairers, bold, repairers, says goodness and mercy for you. Gerald Wayne says reminders, purge, repairer, repairers, reformer, good word, act. Looks to me like repairs is probably about half of the words here. Stefan says rectification, equanimity, and industrious. <laughs> All excellent words for this chapter, Stefan. Restoration, sever. Um, exhortation, triple threat. I don't, I'm sorry, Jacqueline, I don't understand that. Zer, Ezra, Hez. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Hezekiah, triple threat. I like it. Ties, reformers, set right, repairers, says Jamie P. 814. All right, well, it looks like a lot of repairers, and this was a great couple of chapters, wasn't it? I mean, awesome. So good. Example says out to chat. Yeah, Nehemiah is a good example. Uh, DA, will you post a pic of your all-time references, says Lenny9802. Yes, I will, but not until the very end because I might add some more. But yes, I will definitely do that. I'll also, I'll also post pictures of my uh, table of contents where I have all of my words. 
Sever, that's a great word. Fixer, says Minka. Oh, I like that. I like that. It's like a repairer. Okay, everybody, I, I love you all so much. Uh, I, I need to get going because today has been a huge day, a busy day, but we are back tomorrow, remember, for the rare double header, not just a double chapter, but a double header. First one will be at about two o'clock mountain time. The second one will be again at 7.30 mountain time and we'll have a guest. So mystery guest. So prepare yourself for that. Um, three chapters left. And remember, send an email, david at lightbearers.org. OT with DA drawing is in the subject line. If you want to be entered in the drawing, you've only got about three days to do it. We're going to be giving away two copies of the Conflict Beautiful, two copies of the Light and Life Collection, and two sets of the Light and, uh, the journals, the Types and Symbols journals. Uh, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for these great chapters. And thank you for the example of Nehemiah. Father, his passion and his willingness to do what needed to be done. Father, not always easy. Uh, certainly, he was a man not only of intelligence and of initiative, but a man of great faith whose spirit was wounded deeply by the rebellion and the compromise that was taking place among many in Israel, in Jerusalem in that time. Father, help us to learn the lessons here that we can. Lord, we, we want to take on board this call to reformation, this call to repair. And Father, also this call to remember that, that we can rejoice because you have heard our prayers and we are pardoned through Jesus if we have confessed our sins to you. So Father, we receive that right now and teach us how to rejoice. Uh, as, as somebody said there, I, I, think it, I, don't, I think it was Dashy Dash. She said, sometimes you have to give yourself a stern talking to. Father, help us to tell ourselves the things that we need to hear. And help us to tell others around us the things that they need to hear. If they need to, if they need to rejoice, and remember that the joy of the Lord is their strength. Father, make us those people, those catalysts in our families, in our local situations, in our communities. Father, make us those people, repairers, restorers, reformers. Uh, Lord, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. We need the infilling of the Spirit and the righteousness of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen.